Empezamos ya, sí, de señores y señoras, benvinguts, benvingudes. Uh, my name is John London. I'm the director of the Center for Catalan Studies at Queen Mary University of London. If you look in the chat, uh, the assistant Isabel Crespi will put in an address for the center so you can find out more information. Please sign up to receive notice about what we do and go on our Twitter account as well, which will also be in the chat that's uh, going live now. I would also say to anticipate what the director of the London Institute of Cervantes is going to say as well, please use the chat uh, for questions for this uh, lecture. It's really gives me enormous pleasure to present the person who's going to present, but really we want to do this together. The second Joanotte Mortorei lecture, a uh, collaboration between the Instituto Cervantes and the Center for Catalan Studies at Queen Mary. We thought, as I explained last year, but there's been more progress on that, we thought how we could name a lecture in literature, an annual lecture in literature that would be associated with Queen Mary, we went through several names. And then we came up with Tiran Lo Blanc. And then we thought nobody really know Tiran Lo Blanc unless they knew about Catalan literature, perhaps. Um, and then we thought the idea would be fantastic to have our sponsor, that would be uh, Joanat Marturei, who is the main author of this 15th century novel that was so important for the development of literature um, in the early Renaissance and later on, of course. The progress I have to report on that. Uh, the co-author, of course, Martí Juan de Galba, but uh, really played a minor role. The progress I have to report in that from Queen Mary is that we have a doctoral student who is doing research precisely on the English reception of the novel Tirano Blanc. And 
if you know anything about the novel, you'll know that it plays with the idea that it in fact is translated from the English. So then to have the reception of this Catalan novel in English, although it wasn't translated until the 20th century, is, is fascinating. So it's the second lecture. We have a very prestigious guest who's going to be introduced most formally. Let me pass you on to Ignacio Peiro, the director of the Instituto Cervantes in London, and welcome you all to this evening. We're delighted to see you, and we'll be delighted to have your questions after the talk. We're looking forward to this talk. I want to thank in advance Juan Luis Marfan, Professor Marfan, for his collaboration in this strange medium which we're all tied to in these times of pandemic. Um, and again, the Instituto Cervantes and its director, Ignacio Peiro, for this collaboration. Ben Bigut, Ben Bigut. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor London, uh, for your introduction and uh, your kind words. I will be extremely brief this evening, but please allow me a minute for a short introduction um, as well. It is indeed an honor to co-host this Joanot Martorell talk on Catalan literature, which as you all know, and as John London has just mentioned, is a joint effort between the Center for Catalan Studies at Queen Mary and the Instituto Cervantes uh, branch in London. It is indeed the second installment of these talks after last year's lecture by uh, Jordi Amat. And what John London and myself had in mind when we decided to launch um, this conference in 2019, it was to bring year after year well-respected academics, scholars, and public intellectuals from the Catalan speaking world, or at least experts in the field, to spread the word about Catalan culture for and Catalan literature for a wider audience. I want therefore to say a big gracias to Professor uh, Juan Luis Marfagne for his availability and also for willing to share his knowledge with all of us today. For those of us who have read Roman's languages, the famous Romanicas, Marfagne is a classic in every bibliography. And having arrived in England decades ago, I if I'm not mistaken, in the 1970s, he has also managed to become a legend in Catalan studies in the United Kingdom. A few words cannot do justice to his distinguished career, but I would like to briefly summarize his work. A professor in Liverpool, our guest today read Roman's languages in Barcelona, where he was a disciple of a very noted historian of literature, uh, Joaquim Molas, and was also influenced by the Gramscian historical analysis. All over his academic career, Professor Marfain has pursued different interests. He has researched extensively on medieval and Renaissance Catalan poetry. And he has also worked on the edition of the complete poems of one of the most important poets of the Hispanic world in the 20th century, namely Carlos Riva. He has also focused on uh, Joan Maragall and the Modernismo movement to which he contributed one of his most lauded books, Aspectas del Modernismo. His long-standing interest in Catalan language and history has also led him to write books such as La Cultura del Catalanismo. And in these last few years, he has delved deep into the Renaissance as a defining moment in shaping Catalonia's modernity as we know it since the 19th century onwards. It is about that moment, legendary born out of the Oda a la Patria by Arribao in the 1830s that Professor Marfagne will talk this evening. Well, that's most uh, everything for me. And I want to thank you all, um, Amics y Amigas, for being with us today. In particular, I would like to thank John London and Isabel Crespi of Queen Mary for setting this all up with us. It's been a pleasure to work again with you this year. I also know that Mark Duenas, my colleague from Institute Yul, is among the audience this evening. Thank you, Mark for being here and also for helping advertise this event. Both our institutions signed a collaboration agreement not long ago and I really appreciate your support. I will now leave the floor to Professor Marfine, but before that, just a few words on how the event will develop. Professor Marfine will deliver his lecture, I guess for maybe 40 or 45 minutes. And those of you who want to ask something or point something out or comment, please feel free to do so in the chat so that at the end of the lecture, Professor Marfine can answer those questions. Also, 
Um, if you could kindly mute your microphones and turn your cameras off, that will be better for the rest. And that's all for me. Uh, gracias again. And Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Um, thank you to the Instituto Cervantes and to the Center for Catalan Studies at QMC for giving me this opportunity to address you all today. Um, in this difficult situation, it would have been so much nicer to talk to you directly in person, but there we are. On the plus side, I must say that this is the first time I address an audience in my slippers. So there's always a plus to everything. Right, without any further ado, let's go into the subject. The canonical version of the history of Catalan literature, you probably all know, it's very simple. There was a very impressive uh, early period, medieval period, which then was followed by a very sudden abandonment of Catalan as a, a literary language at the beginning of the 16th century, and there followed three centuries and more of um, uh, decline, of neglect, until starting in the 1830s, there was a gradual movement of revival, which advanced uh, slowly, but which about a uh, hundred years later, in the middle of the, uh, or the early part of the 20th century, came to full fruition and brought, brought Catalan back to what one might term uh, normality as a literary language, judging by the model provided by contemporary uh, big national literatures, in inverted commas, um, all allowances made for think like the difference in population size and so on. Now, there is one basic difficulty with this view, which is the glaring discordance that there is between its chronology and that of uh, the advance of uh, the Spanish language, the expansion of the Spanish language in Catalonia, in Catalan society, and the turning of this society into a diglossic one, that is one in which one whole set of functions are, for one whole set of functions, the language is Spanish, for another set of functions, the language is Catalan. And there is never or rarely any kind of um, um, going over this sharp uh, distinction between the two. Now, this, uh, the ultimate point in this process of advancing diglossia, diglossia happens precisely at the same time, it chronologically coincides with the onset of the Renaissance. Right? And what happens is that up to the so-called War of Independence, the war against Napoleon at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Diglossia had progressed in Catalonia, propelled essentially by upward social mobility. Right? Spanish was the language of royalty, the language of the monarch, and in a society, of the Alsian regime society, where everything cascaded down from the monarchy, but without anybody who aspired to get on in life, well, acquiring Spanish was an absolute must. But in, at the beginning of the 19th century, coinciding with the war against Napoleon, the Spanish nation comes into being the new entity, which is Spain as a nation state. And what happens then in regards to the language is that knowing Spanish is no longer a question of personal advancement in society. It becomes a matter of ideology. It, what propels it is now ideology. All Spanish citizens must possess and use the national language, Spanish. And the Spanish authorities and the Catalan ones, therefore, 
must, it's their responsibility to make sure that their citizens are in a position to use Spanish and do so. Now, this, as I say, starts with the war of, of independence and reaches its uh, ultimate goal in the period between 1830 and 1870, which is, as I said, coincides entirely with the period was known as the onset of the Renaissance also. But there's more to it than that. What happens also is that the people behind this drive to turn Spanish into the national language and to diffuse it uh, 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 in, around Catalonia as such are exactly, precisely the same people who are traditionally identified as the fathers of the Renaissance. Exactly the same individuals. So how do you then reconcile these two facts? Well, the answer is you can't. And in view of that, the only wise thing to do is to take an entirely different approach and forgetting all preconceptions about what is a national literature and how a normal national literature is supposed to be and how this is to be attained, let's just look at what happens in literary terms in Catalonia during this period and then take it from there. Now, the long period, as long as secular period, three secular period, uh, between the medieval period and the supposed onset of the Renaissance, is known in the traditional view as the decadencia, the decline of the Catalan. And this is an apt term because really uh, what happens to Catalan letters during that protracted a long period is best described as decline. Um, literary activity in Catalonia is scarce, uh, of an appalling mediocrity, totally lacking in ambition, completely cut off from contemporary literary developments and fashions elsewhere in Europe, in nearby Castile to begin with. Uh, in other words, you know, a pretty grim. Uh, panorama. Um, the, um, by the end, on the eve of the War of Independence, literature in Catalonia moved within the very narrow limits of a typical provincial Ancien Regime culture. Um, the problem here is that Catalonia is removed, far removed from the court, and uh, this means that uh, at a time when literary and cultural activities in general are tightly linked to the court, a uh, court in life, um, in Catalonia, there is no room for the development of such a cultural life. Uh, Catalonia lacks both the centers of patronage, the royal court to begin with, but also uh, big aristocratic families, and it also lacks the centers of uh, uh, royal administration where the sinecures are dished out to writers. So uh, they can have a, a secure, guaranteed existence, and at the, time, at the same time, be free to produce their literature or their art or whatever. All these, as I say, it's missing in Catalonia. Plus another very important fact, which is that publishing in Spain is at the time under very severe restrictions and um, publishing and indeed uh, play uh, staging is subject to uh, absolutely necessary licenses from the Consejo de Castilla, which is from the government itself. And this cannot be obtained locally. Locally, all you can produce are small, very thin pamphlets, no more than 50, 50 pages at the most. Uh, that can be produced with just local permission from the local authorities. Um, but nothing else can't be published 
uh, with, without the permission of the license of the Consejo de Castilla. And the, the same goes for all plays. You cannot perform a play without having obtained first permission from, again, the Consejo de Castilla. Right, so no literary life worth speaking of in Catalonia was possible at all. So what got published then in Catalonia was stuff that was aimed at uh, a very specific demand or sets of demands from very specific uh, groups of people. Oratorios, panegyrics, uh, commemorative sermons, relations, public relations of um, uh, big solemn uh, civic occasions such as a royal visit or a royal death or a royal marriage or something like that. Um, all this in Spanish, needless to say, or occasionally in Latin, not in Catalan. Um, as for its diffusion, it rarely reached beyond the very narrow circles uh, that produced it and, and received it. Um, and from the point of view of the form, it was in answer to a, the fossilized aesthetics of uh, the uh, teaching uh, classes of rhetoric and poetry, which constituted at the time the top level, the final form in what anachronistically we could describe as the period's secondary education. When you reached the end of that, you were in the rhetoric and poetry class. You learned to make speeches and you learned to write poetry. Poetry of a very specific kind. You, know, you write, you learn to write Ottava Rima, you know, uh, eight lines, uh, stanzas with repeated couplets at the end, um, sonnets, uh, and very few other things. And that was it. Um, as for um, the uh, people producing this uh, type of, this, uh, literature, they were, uh, first of all, the professionals of uh, such teaching in university, the University of Cervera, the only university at the time, or in schools, plus uh, a few amateurs. These amateurs were basically men of the cloth, canons, priests, um, religious of all descriptions, friars, um, and uh, men of the faculties, that is to say, lawyers, physicians, notaries, and that's about it also. Um, to these, now these people uh, spend their uh, uh, considerable leisure time gossiping and uh, playing games in gatherings in sh shop back rooms or uh, lawyers' uh, studies or any you know, similar such tents. And some of these games were of a literary nature. Um, very little of what came out of uh, these gatherings in table literature reached the presses, if anything. Um, some specimens, more felicitous ones, would then be transmitted from one this, of these groups to another uh, by someone who might have a foot in each of the, of the, of the two groups. And in this way, by this uh, means of transmission, some of this stuff um, went, reached further afield and uh, might even sometimes get down on record through uh, the commonplace book of one or other of these individuals who copied it there and uh, in this way preserved it for us. Whatever literature of this kind has come down to us, it has done so in that way. Now, um, so in other words, it never reached an audience. And it never reached an audience simply because there was no audience to, 
to reach. Uh, uh, not even after the Diario de Barcelona was founded in 1792, because in spite of its name, the Diario de Barcelona was nothing like uh, a, a modern newspaper. It, in fact, it was very expensive. It, could all, it was only available through subscription. And what it did is to perform the work that was previously done by these people I have described that moved from one gathering to another, carrying uh, the, a, a, a bit of something that somebody had written there, written down either by word or mouth or written down in a bit of paper. Now, the same people could actually read it, print it on the pages of the Diario de Barcelona. But that didn't mean reaching an audience either, because the Diario de Barcelona had no more than 80, 90, at the best of times, 100 subscribers, no more than that, subscribers, no more than that. Now, the, the big social upheaval that uh, was the Napoleonic occupation and the ensuing war came to change all this. And the absolutely, the, the monarchic uh, restoration that followed in 1814 failed to arrest this change. Uh, it slowed it down, but it could not stop it in the same way as it could not stop the uh, unstoppable decline of the absolute monarchy. Um, so by the 1820s, before the 1820, in fact, there had come to uh, light in, uh, in Barcelona a whole group of would-be writers in a radically different mold from those I've just described before. Um, first of all, uh, these people were had an idea of being professionals, professional writers. They could not uh, actually bring it about, but that was the conception they had in mind of what they would want to be. They were extremely young. They were at the time, they started 15, 16, 17, but they were already publishing, uh, paid it out of their own pockets or rather their, their uh, mom and dad's pocket, pocket, but they were getting their little plays. They had to be necessarily slim, because they had to comply with the restrictions of uh, that operated at the time. But, you know, you, you can publish within 50 pages, you can publish a little uh, poetry book, or you can publish a play. Uh, and this was they were doing. Um, they uh, were all students, or most of them at least were students at Cervera, uh, where they studied basically law, practically all of them, one or two uh, studies, students of medicine, but mostly of law. But they were not students in the typical Austrian regime mold again. Uh, in the Austrian regime, uh, the students constituted a very clearly defined uh, social group, a caste, recognizable by some form of, of external sign, a, a uniform in fact, or at the very least an emblem of some, of some description. Um, these new students were students of, of a new time, where what was began to be known at the time as la juventud estudiosa, which really means young, the young people eager to learn. Now, they, of course, went to Cervera to study, but in that, to that extent, what they did was go through the motions, go through the necessary steps that would lead to a degree, and perhaps in the future, who knows, maybe they would have to, to become lawyers or, you know, but that was just, that was not what their heart was and their efforts went into. For the real learning, they turn to a different set of institutions, all of them 
of very recent creation. And what the kind of tuition these institutions provided was tuition in new forms of knowledge the universities did not offer. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, botany, uh, the newfangled science of political economy, and also modern languages, which meant essentially French and Italian. The main institution supplying this need was the Junta de Comercio. The Junta de Comercio was the royal charter body, without the royal charter, nothing could exist, uh, which looked after the interests of Catalan merchants and manufacturers. Um, but it was these people who, out of their subscription to the body, financed a series of, they call them chairs, a series of classes in the subjects I've just mentioned. And all these new type uh, of writer, all these new intellectuals flocked to these classes, eager to learn all these new uh, stuff that you couldn't learn anywhere else. Now, in correspondence with this, these people, these young would-be writers, came from the very same social sections that were feeding into the making of this new Catalan capitalist bourgeoisie. Right? They were the, the children of small merchants or small manufacturers. The big ones had other means of uh, you know, achieving uh, some kind of their own social status. They didn't need to go through this. There were the children also of what, again, anachronistically, we might call civil servants. In fact, employees of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the administration. Um, occasionally, there was the odd uh, son of a landowner or an, of, an army officer, but these were few. Uh, most of them were the sons, and I say sons because at this time there still there were still no women involved in all this. The sons of uh, members of the, what I called before the faculties, the sons of lawyers, doctors, etc. But what must be remembered is that at this time. Precisely, those old faculties were themselves being transformed into modern liberal professions. Now, for these would-be writers, writing was to be their own way of access into the bourgeoisie. Um, where there were amongst them no aristocrats, and there were amongst them no people who, from the word go, uh, were destined for uh, the church. A f some of them were forced by circumstances actually into that state. Like also, there were some who eventually, sooner or later, but sooner rather than later, would uh, resign themselves to become simply lawyers or doctors. But insofar as it, uh, that happened, those people dropped out of the race and abandoned their early dreams. Those who persisted also were forced very soon into compromise. But the important thing is that the, the kind of uh, occupations they found that would guarantee them some kind of uh, a stable income while at the same time giving them opportunity and free time to carry on writing where um, the, um, they, they, uh, they achieved or they, they could get those occupations on the strength of their reputation as writers. It was their ability with the pen that secured them the occupations that would allow them to carry on writing. So, in other words, in their own eyes and in the eyes of society at large, writer was what they was, what they were in the first place. 
that was the defining nature. Now, this process was a protracted one, just as the absolute monarchy took a long time to, to die. But there were no setbacks. It was irreversible. And other people uh, came on, uh, sometimes a, a, a trickle, at other times there were clusters of, of, of people. But there was a second uh, moment, a second time where uh, a whole big cluster of uh, new young would-be writers appeared on the scene. And that coincided on the one hand with the final onslaught of the absolute monarchy started in 1835 and ending in 1840, which brought about um, the um, absolute monarchy and brought about a modern uh, parliamentary democracy of sorts, uh, a modern liberal state. Um, and it also coincided at the same time with the introduction of Romanticism into Spain. Uh, the, this uh, romantic period, uh, this romantic episode in Catalonia, in Spain in general too, but also particularly in Catalonia, was uh, very, very, very intense, but also very, very short-lived. It began in the early 1836, 1836, and by the end of 1839, it was all over, absolutely finished. Um, at the same time, uh, most of these romantics who had started at the beginning as progressive liberals, ardent liberals of the left-wing persuasion, by 1839 ended up not just renouncing romanticism, true romanticism, uh, same, you know, uh, slagging Victor Hugo and Alexandre Dumas, whom they had uh, they were put on, a, on an altar in 1836, but also they had turned into a very, very conservative, moderate liberals. Um, there were one or two who remained faithful not to Romanticism. They also renounced Romanticism, but to political progressivism. Um, they managed still to survive uh, during the period known as the Trienio Spartanista, the three years which, in which uh, uh, the General Espartero having ousted the Queen Mother from the Regency uh, in a coup, uh, became in himself the regent, um, a period which ended in 1843. When this period came to an end in 1843, in fact, even before it came to a complete end, the remaining progressives amongst the ex-romantics in Catalonia had already got out of the way and were all in Madrid, where life was for them a bit easier than it would have been in Catalonia. So from 1843 onwards, Catalan literary life is in the hands, entirely in the hands of these ex-romantic moderates. Now, the replacement of true uh, romanticism by a very pale, tame, uh, trivialized version is a general Spanish phenomenon. But in Catalonia, it took a very uh, distinctive uh, aspect. It was even more conservative than elsewhere in Spain, to the extent that it explicitly uh, subordinated all aesthetic considerations to moral, Catholic moral prescriptions. If it was immoral from a Catholic point of view, then it was but from a literary point of view, it could not be tolerated. And the other uh, uh, distinctive uh, aspect was that it was very restricted in, even in genre, the novel was banned, could write novels. Novels were uh, published and read in Catalonia, but there were translations. Uh, 
no novels were written by Catalan writers. Uh, they had a few written a few historical novels early on in the early 30s, but no longer in the 1840s. And uh, uh, the, as far as the other genres were concerned, they were uh, restricted to two basic strands. On the one hand, the recreation and exaltation of a highly idealized medieval Catalonia, and on the other hand, the imitation of traditional poetry and traditional tales. So, in other words, there was above all a blunt refusal to engage at all with contemporary social reality in any shape or form. At the same time, the two things are closely connected, the Catalan moderate ex romantics pursued what one of them called uh, the, in 1941, their literary independence. What this meant was independence from Madrid, of course. Um, now, from the word go, these new kind of writers from the late 1810s, when they came on the scene, they had thought of themselves in terms of as Spanish writers, and they had thought of the same as publishing for the whole of the Spanish audience, the whole of the Spanish public, uh, to be national Spanish writers. This, at the time, and under the conditions of the absolute monarchy, was, of course, wishful thinking. It was a, a, an unrealizable um, a, uh, ideal. But when, with the demise of uh, the uh, absolute monarchy, um, the a national literary market began to be a developing possibility, then Madrid writers had a head start for the reason I mentioned earlier on of the restrictions operating upon publishing in, in Spain. Um, there had been no opportunity at all in the provinces for printers to become publishers. I mean, if all they could publish was you know, little pamphlets or no more than 50 pages, who would want to be a publisher? I mean, where was the money to be made? In Madrid, on the other hand, where people were publishing books was possible and books were indeed being published, there were already printers who, who could be described as modern publishers. So these people, as I say, had a head start. The answer to this is seems very obvious. Well, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So go to Madrid and get a foothold there in uh, the, the Madrid stage, uh, in the Madrid press, etc. Make a name for yourself. But easier said than done, of course. The competition was fierce, and it was fierce. Not it was only. You had to deal not only with the competition of already established Madrilean writers. By Madrilean, I mean writers in Madrid. They weren't necessarily Madrilean, but very few of them were Madrilean, but they had been living in Madrid for a long time. Um, but there was also competition from all the writers from the provinces, from all the other provinces who had had the same idea and who were moving to Madrid with the same uh, thought in mind. So, uh, uh, the people who did try, and there were one or two who did, failed. Now, there was not so much an alternative uh, strategy as a complementary one to this, which was the creation of a kind of alliance of provincial writers. Um, and this came uh, about through uh, the uh, vast network of very little literary, local literary reviews, which were normally very ephemeral. I mean, at, at most they lasted, it would last a year, but it didn't matter. Once one of them disappeared, another one came up. And these, uh, these local uh, provincial writers moved about, not themselves physically, but sent their stuff 
to all these local little provinces. So somebody in Barcelona would send his, his poems to Oviedo, to Cadiz, to Malaga, uh, and, and, and vice versa. People in Oviedo or in, in Valladolid or whatever, in Santiago, would send the stuff to Barcelona to be published there. Um, and they were all extremely friendly and, and all their stuff was always preceded by a, a dedication to uh, my dear friend, uh, and then the name of the editor of the local literary review for which the stuff was intended. Um, now it's not hard to see that uh, the whole thing was a symbolic gesture rather than a solution to the problem. But in Catalonia, at least, it opened some people's eyes to the possibilities offered by a likely expansion of the regional publishing industry. Um, and the crucial importance then of being quick to grab uh, this emerging regional market. Um, some Barcelona publishers had indeed begun to turn in, uh, printers rather, had indeed begun to turn into modern publishers and to compete with Madrid. Uh, initially, obviously, compete with Madrid on the home ground. Uh, so, to, you know, keep the Madrid uh, publishers out with their own editions of the same kind of stuff. Translations of foreign novels, for instance. I mean, all the great you know, successors of contemporary, the contemporary European novel, all the novels by Eugene Sue, all the novels by Victor Hugo, uh, all such stuff, had editions published in Madrid, but had also editions published in Barcelona. And very often, and increasingly so, the Barcelona publisher was quicker than the Madrid one, or it was cheaper than the Madrid one, and so on. So there was that kind of, of new opportunity uh, arising, and as I say, it was important to grab that market before anybody else uh, could intrude in, into it. Um, now, from a combination of this particular uh, group interests, professional interests of, of the writers, and their solidarity with the class of origin, the class to which they aspired to be a part of, um, the uh, ex-romantics who, as I said before now, had complete control of literary life in Catalonia, developed uh, the sense of a historical mission. Um, and this mission was that of supplying the Catalan capitalist bourgeoisie with an ideology, with a sense of self, a distinctive sense of self, and a distinctive regional, um, regionalistic um, ideology that would equip them to compete with other similar interests uh, in the rest of the state for a say in how Spanish politics had to be conducted in particular in a crucial field for this bourgeoisie, which was that of the economy. And more specifically in the field of offering protection to the emerging developing Catalan industry. Now, such a close alliance between writers and class did not come about uh, overnight, of course, but over a, 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 a through a process marked at the start by the enthusiastic civic reception given to the Queen Mother, to Christina, on her return from exile in 1844, when a welcoming committee, which was formed by the big cheeses uh, in the Junta de Comercio once again, uh, enlisted the services of absolutely anyone in Catalonia who could pen a, a ballad, a romance, uh, a romance uh, on the occasion. Um, and the process 
uh, uh, referring to culminated on in 15 years later in 1859 with the foundation of the Jacques Florals de Barcelona, the Floral Games, literally, the Barcelona. Another civic occasion sponsored by the local authorities and the local uh, uh, big cheese. Um, and uh, uh, this uh, social occasion, this civic occasion rather, would then take place on a yearly basis, year in, year out, on the same day, the first Sunday in May, and this would go on till the end of the century and even beyond. Um, now, floral games of this kind, the Juegos Florales, were nothing new and were not in any way specifically Catalan. They had been held, they had been held elsewhere before in Spain, in the 19th century, recently. In Madrid, for instance, Aliceo Madrileño had organized uh, such Juegos Florales. Uh, in Granada, in Cordoba, <coughs> and other places, Coruña. Um, but uh, under the same uh, external appearance you know, of any twee, and at the same time pompously civic occasion, uh, under the same apparent surface, the Catalan Jocs Florals were again very peculiar. Um, well, first of all, the creation was presented not as such, but as a restoration, the restoration of a similar uh, event which had been supposedly taking place in Catalonia in the Middle Ages. So this was now being restored in the same way as Catalan literature was, as a whole, was being restored after three centuries of practically death. And uh, furthermore, the poets competed in one of three, one or another, or all at the same time, of three very sharply defined categories, which corresponded to the, the triple motto of the Jocs Florals, Patria, Fides, Amor. Fatherland, Faith, Love. Now, the love category was, uh, in a way, represented society's recognition of the importance of literature and poetry more specifically. This was a spiritual adornment a modern civilized society could not do without. And uh, it, love was, in a sense, the ultimate distillation, the supreme form of this social ornament. Religion, faith, this category was a, a reminder of uh, the essential conservatism of both literature and politics in Catalonia. And finally, the fatherland category was very, very peculiar. The, although this was never stipulated, in fact, it had only room for poems which uh, recreated, revived medieval Catalonia, medieval independent Catalonia, poems about the, the, the great Catalan uh, historical events or myths of the Middle Ages. Last but not least, although this was only a last minute decision, the competitive poems must be written in Catalan. Now, in the canonical view I mentioned at the beginning, this shows that the restoration of the Jungs Rials as the decisive step in the Renaissance, the, tom, the time when a movement which up to then had been gathering momentum quietly, almost secretly, suddenly burst into public life with a loud declaration of intent. Catalan literature was restored. It was here again and to stay. Um, now, 
a quick glance at the CVs of the people involved, a quick glance at the CVs of the fathers of the Renaissance, a quick glance at the CVs of all the poets competing at the jocks for us, shows that this was poppycock, nothing else. These people wrote in Catalan indeed, but in Catalan, they only wrote poetry. And not only that, they don't write any kind of poetry. They wrote Jacques Fural's type of poetry, poetry that could go either to the Amor or to the Fides or to the Patria category. And in fact, most of the time, they wrote poems for the Jacques Fural's. I'll tell the lie. They also wrote speeches, right? They wrote a speech in Catalan, and that was a one of thing, when it was the turn to be the president of the Jacques Fourals and to have and they had to deliver the speech at the time. That's one they actually wrote prose in Catalan. Otherwise, poems for the Jacques Fourals. Now the um, the whole operation obviously required that there be no Catalan literature other than the one that was thus supposedly restored in the Jocs for us. Thence the invention of this idea of the Renaissance. Initially, they talked about El Renacimiento Literario Catalan, which means the same, the, the Renaissance of Catalan. Uh, literary renaissance of Catalan. Um, but this eventually, some years later, quite a few years later actually, became La Renaissance. This is the, day, the term that then became consecrated. But the truth, the real truth is that there was never a time in all those three odd centuries uh, since the beginning of the 16th century at which Catalan had not been written, when nothing was written in Catalan. There had never been such a time. Um, for by, by the end of uh, the 19th century, it was absolutely certain that Catalan was dead to the Republic of Letters, as somebody put it. But it was not dead. It had access to Parnassus. In fact, in this imperial region, there was a little, a tiny, tiny little corner that was specifically Catalan. There was a Catalan Parnassus. In other words, there had always been, poetry had always been written in Catalan throughout those centuries. Now, it, it was, it had even its protective divinity in the person of uh, the most famous, the most celebrated author of the 17th century, Francesc Vicente Garcia, um, with, who was better known as the Rector of Alforona. Now, this man's works were um, reissued five times between 1820 and 1856. Um, this was completely ignored by the fathers of the Renaissance, as if it didn't exist. Um, now, there were considerable limitations to this poetry. Um, uh, it was limited in, in scope, it was limited in, uh, in ambition. Uh, it was very much like the type of, this, of literature I described, the type of poetry I described earlier on written in Spanish then, mostly uh, in the 1790s, just before the, you know, the, the War of Independence. Um, but on some exceptional occasions, it could rise to uh, um, higher things. Um, for instance, uh, there was a double royal wedding in Barcelona in 1802, uh, which was celebrated. And, and this involved the writing of poetry. Uh, or there were the festivities for the, to celebrate the, uh, the swearing of Isabella II as rightful heir, legitimate heir to the throne in 1833. On occasions like that, 
then some local poet would be asked to produce uh, some uh, poem, a proper poem that would befit the occasion. Um, and that would be a poem in ottava rima again, or sometimes in, in uh, ter sets, but uh, it, a poem with a certain type of, of ambitions. And finally, there was another uh, occasion on which this uh, poetry could rise to uh, uh, higher things. And that was without any prompting, when somebody got it into his head to write a homage to the language itself, to show to everybody that if Catalan was abandoned as a literary language, this had nothing to do with any intrinsic deficiencies of Catalan as a possible literary language. And to show this, they then went on to write an epic poem, right? Or something like that. These things remain basically uh, unpublished uh, in manuscript form. But occasionally they got into, into print. Um, one thing was the translation of big classics, for instance, um, Tasso's uh, Jerusalem Mel Liberato. You translate that into Catalan, you show them, you can't translate the Jerusalem Liberata into Catalan. And even there was one of the Romantics who, in 1836, showed to show that Catalan, you could write anything in Catalan, wrote a fashionable modern romantic poem in Catalan, a one of thing. He wrote lots and lots of poetry, all in Spanish. It was the only time he did Catalan, and he did it purely to show that it could be done. It could be done, but it shouldn't. That was the message. Now, faced with the fact of this living tradition of Catalan writing, the inventors of the Renaissance adopted the well-tried tactic of heads I win, tails you lose. So uh, those things that they could not ignore or denigrate, they co-opted. The perfect example is the work that is in the canonical vision regarded as the wake up cry that started the Renaissance. Now this was a poem that was written on the, uh, for the 6th of uh, January, 1833, to celebrate the Saints Day of a big Madrid banker who happened to be a Catalan. And on this occasion, his closest employees who were all also Catalans were to present him with poems allusive to aspects of his personality and written each one of them in a different language. One in French, one in Italian, one in Spanish, one in Latin, one in modern Greek even, and one in Catalan. Right, the man who had to write the one in Catalan exploited very cleverly the fact that both the recipient of the homage, the homage and himself were Catalan expatriates in Madrid. And the gist of the poem is, you know, when for, for two people like us, there's nothing better, nothing that gives us more pleasure than to talk in Catalan in this, you know, so far away from our you know, homeland. And uh, when we talk in Catalan, we speak from the bottom of our heart. So when I say to you, my boss, that you are the least beast, I'm not just licking your boots, I'm speaking, I'm you know, really, really sincere, I'm speaking from my heart. Well, that poem was then taken and transformed into an ode to the fatherland, Oda a la Patria. It was never called that, and it was never that. It was never an ode to anybody, and certainly not to Catalonia. But that is what the fathers of the Renaissance very successfully turned it into. And now people refer to it as the Oda la Patria. Forget it. That's one thing it certainly was not. And the rest of the stuff, they simply dismissed in bulk as vulgar and old fashioned. And certainly vulgar and old fashioned is what most of it was. But not necessarily and not all. Uh, in the 1840s, it became fashionable, the fashion came from France, um, for people to dance to modern 
style dancing, waltzes, mazurkas, polkas, not only to, to the accompaniment of, of, of an orchestra, but also to the accompaniment of, of words sung by a choir. Right. Well, there was a provider of this type of entertainment, a Catalan provider, a man called Clave, who um, wrote this kind of stuff, mostly in Spanish, but quite a bit of it, about, let's say, 50% of it, at least, of his whole production in Catalan too. So Catalan had still possibilities, the living uh, Catalan tradition has still possibilities uh, as a, a modern literary language. Um, as against this, what the fathers of the Renaissance had to offer, what they did, what they did was to try and kill this living tradition and it instead enthroned what can only be described as an embalmed corpse, because that is what the literature produced by the Jacques was. It is nowadays absolutely unreadable, and it always was. Um, but that is all that these people really achieved. They didn't quite manage what they were trying to do, thank God, but it was a very close thing. But when the restoration of Catalan as a literary language eventually came, because it did come about, then it owed nothing to the Renaissance. It was a fresh start from new uh, circumstances. And this is the fundamental point. If all we do is push forward this so-called Renaissance and say, right, yeah, okay, okay. I mean, the, what happened in 1830, 1859 and beyond was not the Renaissance, but Renaissance simply happened later. To, in other words, to pose the problem in terms of Renaissance, of a rebirth, is wrong. What we want to do is this, is think in, those ter in these terms. At some point in history, a set of circumstances pushed Catalans into the conviction that their own language was not fit for certain purposes, right? Now, what is the set of circumstances that at a later point in history led Catalans to revise and reject that idea? That is the question we must ask. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you very much, Professor Martin, for this um, fascinating overview of a um, period that is fascinating as well. And uh, well, um, your words, maybe uh, debunking some well-established views, have um, well, well, some some questions uh, have have well have sparked the interest of of, of the audience today. So using the privilege of the host, um, John London uh, wants to ask, to what extent do you think we need to reassess earlier literary activity in Menorca with the Enlightenment connections under the British rule? Two, to a lesser extent, the few attempts uh, that were made in French Catalonia and uh, last uh, popular theater, uh, above all entremesos, in all Catalan speaking areas. Should do, do these efforts uh, uh, require, um, uh, should we revisit them? Are they worth of our attention or what do you think? Well, I mean, yes, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, in my view, all these things uh, are, belong still uh, in the Ancien Regime. We are still dealing with the type of writer and we're still dealing with the, uh, the type of literature, of literary life that belongs to the Ancien Regime. The people who write these things are uh, the, the people I described before. You know, they're sort of uh, uh, lawyers, Canons, uh, you know, uh, or 
in this case, there are aristocrats uh, with plenty of leisure, uh, with no uh, need to earn a living in any way or other, and who then sort of pass their leisure uh, in, uh, in this kind of pursuits. And again, uh, the, what they produce circulates amongst a close circle of similar people. And this, in, in places like uh, the islands, uh, persists uh, throughout the the, um, the 19th century. I mean, you know, in Mallorca, I mean, people like Pedro Alcantara Peña or Bartomeu Ferrà, uh, these people are still perpetuating uh, the the type of, of writer uh, that uh, the Comte de Diamants was uh, at the at the beginning of a, of a century. Um, it's still uh, that's still uh, very much. The literary life that goes on in, in Mallorca still, or Menorca, still goes on in this kind of circles. The, the uh, Mallorcan writers in the modern mold move out of Mallorca and, and to Catalonia. That's where they find uh, the, the conditions for the development of, of literature uh, along modern lines, along, uh, not at home. Uh, or if they stay, if they stay in Mallorca, they live a, a, a funny double life. I mean, you know, they are they are Alcian regime writers in Mallorca, modern writers when they, they they cross over and and you know move to uh, and the same is true then of, of uh, any other. I mean, Lalgue is a, you know, a very typical case. I mean, uh, that is quite a, 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 a an interesting literary life there at the end of of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. But it's this, it, it, you know, it, it moves in a very tight circle. Um, in Catalonia itself, um, this kind of writer still persists in the 19th century. I mean, Francesc Renard de Arouz is a perfect example of that. He's a man who, uh, he's, he's an architect. And I mean, he, he belongs to the new class. He belongs to the new bourgeoisie as an architect. He has become a new a member of a new profession, and as such, he is a, a, a bourgeois. But as a writer, is a, a writer of the Ancien Regime. He writes to fill his leisure, his leisure, and and he says so himself. He says that you know, writing to him is a, a way of uh, you know uh, passing the time uh, and resting from his real professional pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, Professor. Um... Just in order to, to speed things uh, up a bit, um, there is another question, but I have two questions more. Um, and one is by James Thomas. Uh, and he says, did Madrid intellectuals play as big a role in the Catalan Renaissance as Parisian ones did for the Felibrige Provencal movement, for the Provencal Renaissance? Sorry, uh, uh, did, did Madrid writers? Did Madrid intellectuals play mm -hmm. as big a role in the Catalan uh, Renaissance as uh, Parisian intellectuals did in the Provencal Renaissance in the... Pen oh, right, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, the, the, uh, there was... Uh, occasionally, was it... Uh, a very a certain uh, interesting uh, contact from one particular man who is a very much a forgotten man in, in Spanish uh, literature, but at the time was was very successful, who uh, was Antonio Trueba, who at the time did not sign Antonio Trueba, but Antonio T. y la Quintana, uh, and who did not write the kind of stuff he would become famous later on for, the sort of little stories, but wrote poetry uh, of a romantic kind. This man had very close contacts with, uh, with some of the Catalan uh, writers, um, but this uh, didn't last very long. Um, he, in particular, was close to Milay Fontanars, for instance. Uh, so there were, there were uh, a few personal contacts as such, but there was not a significant presence and, and there was no 
important role played in, in any way in respect. No, no, the, the, the idea of uh, the, the literary independence was very much at the, at the core, at the heart of the, of the this, you know, Renaissance uh, uh, effort. It was, it was to preserve uh, Catalonia uh, as for Catalan writers. And the, 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 initially, the, the jokes for us uh, provoked some bitter reactions from some uh, non-Catalan writers established in Barcelona at the time. It was in particular one man uh, who was who's better known as a musician, Mariano Soriano Fuertes, um, who but who also was a, a writer, uh, and who in fact was the for a while the main editor of one of the newspapers, La Corona de Aragón, and later La Corona simply. Uh, and this man complained bitterly that uh, the you know the the, the rule that uh, Catalan had, must be the language. Uh, of uh, the jocks for us, and no submissions were to be accepted in any other language that did excluded people like him, who was, uh, you know, living in Catalonia, had been living there since uh, the early 1940s, uh, you know, was, you know, he, he was uh, musical director of the Liceo, et cetera, et cetera, but he was being excluded from taking part in this uh, in this event, and it wasn't the only one. There were one or two people, and there were Catalan voices also saying, "Well, you know, this is not right." Uh, you know, but, but those Catalan voices were for people who did not belong to the select group of the fathers of the Renaissance. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and just to um, end up with some um, well, with with the counter now. No? Um, so Amanda Garcia asks, what symbolic anthropological meaning does the legend of counter now uh, have in today's research? Does it fulfill a need to establish connection with Europe's mythical figures or is it based on a genuine Catalan uh, popular figure? Uh, sorry, I'm a bit so, Well, I, um, uh, Amanda uh, Garcia, yeah, uh, yeah. if, if uh, the counter now, uh, yeah myth fulfills a need to establish connections with other uh, mythical figures all over Europe, or yeah. whether well, that is true, or, uh, or if it's based on a genuine Catalan popular figure. So basically, it, 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 a, a 19th century um, pastiche, or, or, or if it's grounded in, in, in some... No, 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 it, no, no, it is, it is, uh, it is a... Um... A native uh, Catalan legend, yeah, and in fact, it, it's you know there, there is there is a part of Catalonia where you know the, 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 in typical fashion there are uh, orographic ge geological uh, things that you know, a, a cave and the things like that that are identified with well, now, uh, and there is a but there's there's uh, literature on, on this. I mean, there is, uh, people have, have written, uh, you know, somebody wrote a thesis back in the 1940s on the legend of Contarnal and its literary treatment. Um, uh, funnily enough, it was uh, it was incorporated into the sort of Jacques Ferrand's uh, literary uh, tradition, but quite late. Uh, I can't remember now. I mean, this is something that I've not uh, you know, touched on for, for a long, long time. Uh, but I think it's not until the 1890s, the early 1890s, maybe a bit earlier, but not much earlier than that, that uh, there is a, a poem of the, the kind of poem that people sent to the job for us about this figure of the counter now. Uh, but uh, uh, but the, 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 the uh, the tradition, uh, which is, as is often the case with these things, not just a single tradition, but a, 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 you know, a, 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 a different uh, strands sort of get together there. There's a series of different local uh, traditions um, where well alive in, in uh, uh, 19th century Catalonia. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, well, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marfine. Um, uh, I feel tempted to to <laughs> to to invite you yet uh, another year to speak, maybe about um, of other fields of your research, from uh, Maragall to Ansan Tormeda. So, um, well, it's been a really a pleasure um, to listen to you, and I want to thank you all, to thank all the audience for being with with us today, and of course, a big thank you. As well for you, um, Professor Marfine. I will. Um, well, if if you want to say a few words um, um, as a farewell, you're more than welcome to do it. And also, John London, uh, for I me, mean, if we could open <laughs> the mic for for Professor London, he will also say a few words. And that's all from me. Muchas gracias. Eu mais queria donar-lhe as graças um, da parte meua e da, da Queen Mary e da, do, do Tom. Muitas graças. Thank you very much indeed. A very stimulating uh, talk. And we could go on and on, but probably only in person with a bottle of wine or several bottles of wine. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite. It's a big argument in which there would be the ghosts of Gramsci and uh, uh, no doubt Joaquim Molas as well present to help us. But for the next time. Who knows? Maybe in the future. <laughs> Let's hope so. Now that the vaccine, <laughs> now that the vaccine apparently is around the corner. Yep. Yep. Anyway, thank yep. you very much. Muchas gracias a todos por la seva atención y gracias a vosotros por haber participado. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Right. Goodbye.